Lethal rhythms. It's not something we ever want to see when we're taking care of patients, but it does sometimes happen. That's exactly what we're going to be talking about today with our ECG study guide series. We're going to be talking about lethal rhythms. Let's get started. So as always, we start with our lethal rhythm concepts. And one of the biggest things that I want you to know when it comes to lethal rhythms is you need to have immediate interventions taking place because honestly, your patient at this point is dead. So let's go through the three different kinds of lethal rhythms that you're going to need to be aware of, especially when you're taking those ECG exams. Ventricular tachycardia, also known as VTAC or VT, is a type of rapid heart rhythm that starts within the ventricles. What's interesting about ventricular tachycardia is that it can occur in the absence of any heart disease and in the presence of structurally normal hearts. This rhythm is typically referred to as idiopathic ventricular tachycardia. Ventricular tachycardia is considered primarily lethal because it disrupts the normal rhythm and pumping efficiency of the heart, which can drastically reduce blood flow to the heart and other vital organs. If sustained or left untreated, ventricular tachycardia can deteriorate into ventricular fibrillation, a more chaotic and ineffective heart rhythm that can lead to sudden cardiac death. The biggest thing I want to note here is that not every patient that has ventricular tachycardia is in a lethal rhythm. There are some patients that kind of just live within this rhythm. So you may be taking care of a patient and they're sitting in their bed playing on their phone and they could go in and out of this rhythm. Unfortunately, sometimes that's normal. So let's talk about rhythm identification. What's an easy way to identify ventricular tachycardia? Well, you can think of it in one of two ways. You can think of it as either being like a tombstone formation or you can think of it as the other way as them looking like a V. So that's the big key takeaway if you're trying to identify a rhythm as ventricular tachycardia is if you see this tombstone like rhythm or this V like rhythm, you're most likely dealing with this particular rhythm. The good thing about this is that the rhythm is usually regular. So as you march it out, you're going to be able to see that they're going to fall in the same place, your R to R, every single time you march it out. Your heart rate is usually going to be greater than 100 beats per minute. There's going to be no P waves here, right? Because this is all happening within the ventricles. Atria are no longer working. That's the biggest key takeaway I want you to take away here is that there's no P wave, no atrial activity. Activity. So of course, if you don't have P waves, you're not going to have any kind of PR intervals. Your QRS complex, remember, anytime we have ventricular or bundle branch in the name, our QRS complex is going to be big, wide, and ugly. And as you can see here, our QRS complex is definitely big, wide, and ugly. So it's going to be greater than 0.12 seconds. And then lastly, any abnormal beats. Well, this isn't really normal. We don't have any of those extra beats, those ectopic beats that you would see in those abnormal beats. When it comes to common causes surrounding ventricular tachycardia, remember sometimes it can be idiopathic, meaning that we really don't know the reason why this happened. It just suddenly occurred. But there are some reasons this could happen. You could see ischemic heart disease. There could be an electrolyte imbalance, specifically like hypokalemia, hypocalcemia, hypomagnesium. So just if you see those lower types of electrolytes, you're probably dealing with some kind of irregularity with your heart rhythm. We also got post-cardiac surgery. You could have dilated and hydroperfect cardiomyopathy. There could even be conduction system diseases that's happening within the electricity of our heart. And these are just a few to name. There's obviously many more causes that could cause this kind of rhythm. So signs and symptoms are like any other rhythm that we typically see whenever we're seeing any kind of irregularity with the heart rhythm. You could have palpitations, dizziness and lightheadedness, syncope is huge, fainting can obviously occur whenever there's an irregularity within the heart system, shortness of breath, chest pain, and the biggest one here that I want you to remember is cardiac arrest. Because as we talked about before, ventricular tachycardia can lead into ventricular fibrillation, which is just cardiac arrest. So when we're talking about treatment for these particular kinds of rhythms, it's really dependent on what's going on with the patient. Do they have a pulse or do they not have a pulse? If they have a pulse and they're stable, then we're going to follow the ACLS algorithm when it comes to tachycardia with a pulse. However, sometimes these individuals can lose a pulse. So in those pulseless situations, we want to follow the ACLS algorithm when it comes to ventricular fibrillation and pulseless ventricular tachycardia. So if you're interested in what this algorithm looks like, specifically if we still have a pulse, this is the general breakdown that was pulled from the American Heart Association's ACLS 
guidelines for 2022. There will be new guidelines coming out in 2025, but these are the most current guidelines. I'm not going to go heavily into detail about this. If you're interested in figuring out what you're going to do for these patients, if you see this kind of rhythm, I highly recommend that you go check out my ACLS videos where I break it down thoroughly. So next up we have ventricular fibrillation, and this is characterized by a rapid erratic electrical activity within our ventricles. This is a more severe form of a cardiac arrhythmia. This rhythm is distinguished by this chaotic, disorganized, with no discernible waves or complexes on the ECG. As you can see here, if we were trying to measure this out, it's really going to be really hard to measure this out because nothing falls in the same place and it just looks like artifact on the screen, but it's not. It's an actual rhythm for this particular individual. What's happening here is that the ventricles are quivering rather than actually contracting coherently like we saw before with our more regular rhythms. So ultimately this quivering is going to lead to a sensation of that effective blood pumping. Just like with ventricular tachycardia, this rhythm can also occur without any prior warning, especially in individuals with undiagnosed heart disease. What's key to note here is that ventricular fibrillation is one of the few cardiac emergencies where immediate intervention with an automated external defibrillator, also known as an AED, can revert the rhythm back to normal, potentially saving this person's life. So let's talk about rhythm identification. So again, when it comes to the rhythm, we have this irregular, chaotic type of rhythm that's taking place. It's very hard for us to measure this out. The heart rate's gonna be indeterminate really because there are no peaks or QRS complexes or atrial rhythms that we're gonna be able to see in order to identify what this person's heart rate's gonna be. And of course, because the atria have kind of given out, again, just like we see with most of our ventricular rhythms, we are gonna have absent P waves and no measurable PR interval. What's big here is that when it comes to the QRS complex, it's going to be unidentified identifiable, right? We really don't know where the QRS complexes are because of this chaotic rhythm. And then lastly, there's going to be no abnormal beats. There's not going to be any ectopic beats or extra beats with this particular kind of rhythm. We just know that ultimately it's going to be lethal. So what are some of the causes behind this particular kind of rhythm? We could see CAD. We could have a myocardial infarction. There could be even scarring taking place on the heart muscle itself from previous infarcts that might have happened. Electrolyte imbalances like like we talked about before, huge whenever we're looking at lethal rhythms. And then of course, ventricular tachycardia that ultimately progressed to ventricular fibrillation could be an additional cause. What's interesting here is that the signs and symptoms are gonna be much more severe because this is a much more lethal rhythm, right? You're gonna see potentially sudden collapse. This rapid erratic pulsation of the ventricles are leading to ineffective heartbeats, meaning we're not really getting any contraction out to the body in order to send all of that blood to our tissues. So somebody could potentially collapse. They could lose consciousness ultimately. We're really not gonna see a pulse when it comes to ventricular fibrillation. And then of course, cessation of breathing. They're not going to be breathing at that point because nothing's getting any oxygen in order to help them breathe. And of course, sudden cardiac arrest is a big sign and symptom when it comes to ventricular fibrillation. So when it comes to treatments with these particular kind of rhythms, we want to follow the ACLS ventricular fibrillation and pulses VTAC algorithm. It's going to be a lot of CPR. We're going to be defibrillating. We're going to be giving epinephrine, amiodarone, or even lidocaine. Next up, we have asystole, and this is characterized as a state of no cardiac electrical activity. There's no movement of blood and there's no detectable pulse. As you can see here, another common name for this would be a flat line because there is no activity taking place at all. What's interesting about this rhythm is it's one of the few cardiac rhythms where resuscitation efforts such as defibrillation is not going to be effective because we don't have any heart rhythm to defibrillate. Defibrillation ultimately relies on the presence of some electrical activity in order to reset it. And in asystole, we're not seeing any activity at all. Asystole is lethal because it represents the cessation of all cardiac electrical activity and effective heartbeats. Without a heartbeat, there's no blood circulation, meaning that there's no oxygen or nutrients that are being delivered to our vital organs, including our brain and the heart itself. If left untreated, this condition leads to organ failure and it's fatal without immediate intervention. So what are we looking at when it comes to rhythm identification? Well, the rhythm's going to be absent. Our heart rate's going to be absent. We have no P wave activity at all in order to 
see a P wave or PR interval, and the QRS is also gonna be absent. We are literally just dealing with a flat line. This is, it happens to be one of the most easiest rhythms to identify because of the absence of electrical activity. So whenever we're talking about causes, we're looking at the five H's and T's. So we start with our H's, we have hypovolemia, we have hypoxia, hydrogen ions, hypo or hyperkalemia, and hypothermia. So starting with hypovolemia, that means that we have a low blood volume that can lead to an inadequate cardiac output and cardiac arrest. With hypoxia, we're having an insufficient oxygenation of the blood that will ultimately lead to cardiac failure. Hydrogen ions, also known as acidosis, is a acid-base imbalance that can disrupt cellular processes and cardiac function. Hyper or hypokalemia means that we're seeing an abnormal potassium level that can lead and ultimately affect cardiac electrical activity and muscle function. And then lastly, with hypothermia, we have someone who, is, has, who has a extremely low body temperature that can slow down metabolic process and electrical conduction pathways in the heart. Moving on to our five Ts, we have tension pneumothorax, cardiac tamponade, toxins, or we could have thrombosis in either the lungs or the heart. With tension pneumothorax, we're dealing with an accumulation of air in the chest cavity that puts pressure on the heart and is ultimately going to impair the ability for the heart to pump effectively. With cardiac tamponade, we're going to see an accumulation of fluid in that pericardial sac. If we have more fluid in that sac, it means it's going to be compressing down on the heart and it's going to hinder the heart's ability to actually expand and contract appropriately. When it comes to toxins, there could be various substances in this situation. You could be dealing with things like medications, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, or even overdoses of other kinds of medications or illicit drugs can ultimately lead to this life-threatening toxicity. Thrombosis when it comes to the pulmonary means that we have a blood clot in the lungs that's ultimately going to obstruct the blood flow and lead to cardiac arrest. And the same thing when it comes to coronary thrombosis, we're going to have a clot somewhere within the coronary arteries that can stop blood flow to a part of the muscle. If that muscle is not getting blood, then we're ultimately going to see a sensation of that heart from being able to pump appropriately because it's not getting the oxygen and the nutrients it needs in order to pump effectively. So what are you going to see when it comes the signs and symptoms of the most lethal rhythm, right? Well, of course, we're going to see an absence of a pulse. The person's going to be unresponsive. They're going to lose consciousness. No breathing is going to be taking place because nothing's getting oxygenated. And then, of course, we're going to see pallor and cyanosis basically means that the person's going to be either very, very pale or they're going to turn blue. And when it comes to treatment of this particular kind of rhythm, we're going to follow the ACLS algorithm for PEA and asystole. The biggest difference here is we're not going to be defibrillating because there's nothing to defibrillate in these particular cases. So we want to make sure that we're following this particular algorithm for these more lethal rhythms. So I know we talked about there being three primary lethal rhythms, but there's actually a fourth. It's just not commonly talked about. In this case, it's called pulseless electrical activity, and it's characterized by an organized electrical activity of the electrocardiogram without any corresponding mechanical heart contractions. Hence, we don't have a detectable pulse. With PEA, there's not a single specific rhythm. Rather, it can be any rhythm. It could be normal sinus rhythm. It could be literally anything. The only difference is, is there's no pulsation taking place. So the big key here that I want you to remember is that when it comes to PEA, you're going to see electrical activity on the screen. But the electrical activity does not mean that the mechanical activity is taking place. Even though the heart's electrical system might be functioning appropriately, it may not be receiving the signals it needs in order to help the heart contract. So while we say electricity, just remember that electricity does not mean mechanical activity. So when it comes to rhythm identification, again, any of this can be variable because we really don't know what the rhythm is going to be. The biggest key here is when it comes to signs and symptoms is you're not going to have a pulse. There's going to be no pulse present with these rhythms. So when we're looking at treatment, we're going to follow that same algorithm that we saw for asystole, right? We're going to be doing some CPR, giving some epinephrine, and we're going to try to treat those H's and T's if they're applicable. So again, here is the ACLS algorithm when it comes to adult cardiac arrest, more specifically ventricular tachycardia, pulseless ventricular tachycardia, asystole, and PEA. We're not going to be going heavily into this because I do have an entire ACLS video that talks about this in depth, but just know, depending on what's going on, you're going to follow one side if you have ventricular fibrillation or pulseless VTAC, or you're going to follow the other side when it comes to asystole and PEA.
So let's do some rhythm identification practice. So we have our first rhythm here. Is our rhythm regular or irregular? Well, if I was to actually march this out, you're gonna see it falls in the exact same place every single time. So we're gonna call this rhythm regular. Next up, we're gonna count our heart rate. So I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, I got approximately 140 beats per minute. Do I see any atrial activity? No, I don't see any here, right? So we know we're not gonna have any P waves and we know we're not gonna have a PR interval. So those are both gonna be absent. Now, is my QRS complex big, wide and ugly or is it narrow and normal? Well, if I look at this, it's huge, right? Look how big this QRS complex is. It's quite large. So if I was to count out all my small boxes, I would say I'm gonna have about 0.22 seconds when it comes to my QRS complex. And do I see any abnormal beats? No, I don't see any abnormal beats here. So the big thing here is I have no atrial activity, I have a big, wide, ugly QRS complex, and I have what looks like tombstones, right? These kind of look like tombstones, or you can say they look like these. So as I know, whenever I have a rhythm that looks like this, I am dealing with a ventricular tachycardia. So taking a look at our next rhythm, what do we have here? It looks really chaotic, right? So when it comes to rhythm, it's gonna be irregular, because if I was to try to march this out, I'm really not gonna be able to march this out appropriately just because how rapid and chaotic this kind of rhythm is. When it comes to my heart rate, I don't really have any kind of organization that's taking place here. So really, I'm not 100% sure what the heart rate is. With P waves, I don't see P waves here. It's just too erratic. So the P waves are gonna be absent and our PR interval is also gonna be absent as well. If I try to measure QRS complexes, again, it's gonna be really hard hard because I don't have any kind of regularities here that I can actually look at. So this again is going to be unidentifiable. And do I see any abnormal beats? Again, I don't. It's just really, really chaotic. So the big thing here is I have an irregular rhythm that's very chaotic and I'm not really able to identify anything here. We know that this is a very lethal rhythm, right? Because we can tell by the fact that there's just no organization taking place. So the only rhythm that looks like this, that is lethal, that follows all all of these guidelines here is going to be our ventricular fibrillation. And last up, I think we have the easiest identifiable kind of rhythm, but we're gonna go through it. Do we have rhythm here? No, right? There's no rhythm at all taking place here. I'm able to find a heart rate because I just have this flat line appearance. There's no P wave activity. There's no PR interval. QRS complex just doesn't exist, right? It's just this completely flat line here. And then of course we have normal, abnormal beats. So what am I dealing with if I've got this flat line? You guessed it, we're dealing with a systole. I hope that this video is helpful in understanding everything you're gonna to need to know when it comes to lethal rhythms on an ECG. As always, if you have any additional questions, make sure that you leave them down below. I love answering your questions. Head over to nursechunkstore.com. There's a ton of additional resources in order to help you ace these ECG concepts. And as always, I'm gonna catch you in the next video. Bye.